interesting. Well, welcome to week four. That was all extra bonus material. Welcome to week four of our New Life sermon series. And this is our after Easter sermon series. This series has to come after Easter because, as you know, New Life wasn't available until after Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us. And it's only through his death and resurrection that we can experience new life. It's only because of what he's done that we have this available to us. But the amazing thing is that it is available to us now. We don't have to wait. We didn't miss the boat. We don't have to do anything except for believe and experience that now. And that is an amazing promise that we have. Our theme verse for this series has been Romans 6, 4. And it says this, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. If we had more time, you could say that's the same thing that happened to the seed. She buried it in the ground, and it came up. That When we baptize people, we put them down, and guess what? If you're kind to the pastor, he don't leave you there. He bring it back up. And that is an, that is an example, or that is a, a demonstration of new life. This new life has begun. It sprung up, just like her plants in the children's sermon. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Now we also may live new lives. We have new things sprouting up in us because of what Christ has done. And that is an amazing thing that we get a chance to live that new life now for each and every one of us and it brings us joy and it brings us blessing as we began to live that out and experience that new life within us it's an amazing thing all that we are learning in this sermon series is building on what we've talked about in previous weeks so let me encourage you to go back and watch the other sermons if you've missed those go back and catch up on some of that that you have missed you can find them on our church youtube channel because i don't want you to miss out on any part of your new life i want you to know all about your new life and so does god He doesn't want you to miss out on any part of the new life that he offers to you because he paid for you to have all of it. He paid for you to enjoy all of it through his son, Jesus Christ. And so I want you to know all that there is that is involved in new life. So go and find that. And we're going to be building off of that yet again today. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to think about what we talked about last week in our sermon. And last week, we talked about taking off our old stinky clothes, right? Our old sin nature. We use the yard work clothes to talk about that. Hopefully, uh, you were doing yard work this week. You were thinking about that. And we talked about we have to take off that old sinful nature. We have to, we have to go and be cleansed by God. We have to allow him to, to cleanse us. And then we have to choose to put on that new nature. And when we put on those clean clothes, and we put on that new nature of Christ, We get his nature. We get to begin to act like him and and enact his actions in this world. And it's such an amazing part of our new life. And then you will recall that as after we put on that new nature, we didn't just stay in the bathroom, right? Or we didn't just stay saved. What what did we do after we got ready? We went out. We were supposed to go out. You're supposed to go out and live that out, not just stand there. You're supposed to go out. And so we are, are sent out into the world to live out this new life. Miss Tara can't leave those plants in her greenhouse forever. They're going to have to go out. They're going to have to be planted, and they're going to have to grow where they're planted in the new world, in the real world, I guess you'd say. I guess the greenhouse is part of the real world. But So I want to pick up on our discussion at that point uh, that we talked about last week. We stopped, or we kind of stopped as we were heading out into the world. We said, you have this new life, and you get to go out and live out in the new world, all cleaned up, all ready to live. So let me ask you a question as we begin to think about what it means to go out into the world. What does it mean to go out into the new world with this new life and with this new nature that's on display for all to see? Because remember, we said we're not going to hide it. We're, we're, gonna, we're supposed to go out and, and demonstrate this new life to others. That's part of the gift of having it. We get to go and live that out. And so if that's what we're to do, let me ask you this. As we go out, what are we to be doing? Uh, we can just go out, but then how many of you just go out and wander around and do nothing? 
few people, if you, have, if you have lots of gas money, other ones, no, I need to know right where I'm going, I need to know what I'm doing. We don't just go hang out, we're to go out and do something specific, and we're going to talk about that today. So as you begin to ponder that question, what is it that we are to go out and do if we have this new life, and if we're sent out to live it, what are we supposed to be doing with it? As you ponder that, I want to help uh, talk about that today and then search the scripture for the answers that God provides us to what we're to do as we head out. As I have said in the weeks prior, spring is a wonderful time to talk about new life because we not only see examples all around us, and I hope that as we progress through this sermon series that you're beginning to see new life all around you. We, our baby birds hatched this week. They're out in our tree. Uh, we have stuff growing up. I can't tell if it's weed or good stuff, but if it's in the wrong area, I just cut it down anyhow and call it good. But all around us is new life, and I hope that you're beginning to experience that and see that. And we also get the privilege of living out examples of new life in front of other people. Whether we realize it or not, we are living it out in front of others. One of the things I look forward to do in spring is to get back out and hike all the beautiful trails in Pennsylvania. We love to get out and hike, and we greatly enjoy getting out and exploring all the things that God has created. I stop and look at the trees. I look at bugs. I look at fungus. We talked about mushrooms last year, how many different kinds of mushrooms you guys got. There is so much to go out and explore and enjoy, and I love doing that. So one of the things that I've done in preparation for this um, season of hiking is I went out and bought new hiking boots. See? I even wore them today. I dressed to match. Got my new hiking boots on. If you can't see that, thanks. Woo! If you can't see my feet, you're blessed. So I put a picture on the screen. I got new boots to go out hiking for this new season. I am excited to get uh, out and try them out. Um, truth be told, I, I had those, these same boots last year, but I wore them out. So I got a new pair for this new year and new spring. I, in all honesty, I wear these same boots pretty much every day to work when you're not here. Uh, most days except Sundays, I could be found in the office wearing these shoes. Um, and that's just what I usually wear on a regular basis. But guess what? They were created to be out in nature. They're supposed to be helping, me, helping to convey me up and down the trails as I explore the great, amazing outdoors of God and not just help me walk up and down the back stairs to the kitchen and the bathroom throughout the day. But they're designed to be in a different setting than just this setting, even though I wear them here. And I can't wait to get these, trails, these boots out on the trail because they, that's where they were made to thrive and that's where they were made to accomplish what they were designed for. There is something exciting about experiencing the fullness of what something is designed to do. How many of you can identify with that? When you actually have either a piece of equipment, we talked about cars a few weeks ago, when you actually get to use all the gear that you have to the fullest extent, that is the most amazing thing ever. If you just have cool stuff and it sits in your garage or it sits in your closet, or if your boots only take you to work and back, that's boring, right? That's not cool. But when you can begin to use your whatever it is to the fullest extent, you begin to appreciate it differently. You begin to be able to see it thrive in the setting that it was created to be in. I am excited to do that with these boots because these boots were provided to, or were designed to provide me traction and stability over uneven ground. That's why I have purchased these boots. They're waterproof because we live in Pennsylvania, right? And I might be out hiking and it could rain one minute and be dry the next and rain the next and we do stream crossings and a bunch of different stuff. And guess what? If I buy waterproof boots, I don't have to worry about it. I'm good to go. I can just keep hiking, keep enjoying. I don't have to worry about it because that's what they're made to do. They're made to take uh, the water. They're made to take uh, uneven ground. They're made to get dirty and muddy and, and get me where I need to go. So I have great confidence when I head, in, head out on the trail with these boots on because I know that that's the environment that they were created to thrive in, not just survived. Now, I've hiked a few trips in shoes that just barely survived. And guess what you do at the end of the day? Your feet are killing you, and you know you didn't thrive in the wilderness. You were just surviving until you could get home and get those shoes off. If you have a good pair of boots, it makes all the difference in the world. Did you know that as we go through those experiences, and as we experience the fullness of what things were designed to do, there's a depth of appreciation for all that we have been gifted with. 
when we begin to use the things that we have, been, that we have to the fullest extent in the, in the setting that they were designed to be used in. And you can, just the amazingness just stretches beyond. Like, man, if I showed you some of the trails I hiked with these boots last year, you'd be like, what? Those got you, your big person, up that? Yeah, it did. Didn't slip, did not nothing, got me right up there. You walked through all that water and no big problem? Yes, we did. No big problem. It's amazing, and I have come to appreciate these boots, so guess what? I bought another pair this year, right? That, when you appreciate something, you're like, yeah, I'm going with that again. This is amazing. I like having that in my life, and it brings me great joy and delight. My friends, yeah, they're made for walking and hiking. Uh, thanks, Carol. The same can be said about our new life in Christ. There is something exciting about getting it out into the real world and beginning to experience the fullness of what your new life was designed for. You have to take it out in the new world, or the real world. You have to take it out. If you're ever going to appreciate all the bells and whistles that the Lord has given you in your new life, you have to get it out into the real world, and you have to use your life as it was designed to be used. Or you'll just be sitting in your office, staring down at your awesome shoes, going, man, I bet those are really cool out in the wilderness. But you'll never know. And you'll never know how much of a gift that really is to you until you get out and put it through the paces in the real world. It's only as we truly live out our new life that we can come to fully appreciate what an amazing gift from God our new life really is. And it really is that good. And it is thousands of times better than new boots. I guarantee it. Getting our real life, our new life out, and living it out for Christ and reward is a thousand times better. So, if you want to experience the fullness of your new life, we need to ask that question. What are we, be, what are we to be doing as we head out into the real world? What is, it that we're, what, what is it that we should be doing? So let's insp- explore the instructions from the Lord today that he has given us in Scripture. We're going to begin with the instructions that come through the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Christians in Rome. You see, these Christians, too, were trying to learn, out, were trying to learn how to live out their new life in Christ. They hadn't had centuries and centuries of Christians before them. They had only had maybe 10, 20, 30 years uh, of Christians living in front of them. And when they became new believers, their seed was planted. They began to grow. But guess what? They needed to figure out, how do I live this new life in Christ? How do I live that in my circumstances, which for them happens to be Rome? For us, it happens to be here. But guess what? The same principles apply to us. And they were just like us, trying to learn to live out their faith. So let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 13, and listen to what Paul tells them that they're to be doing as they take their new faith out into their world as well. Romans chapter 6, verse 13 says this, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. That is an amazing passage of Scripture with a lot of stuff in it. I'm going to just point out a few things for this morning. The first thing that we need to do as we head out into the real world is this. We need to give, you need to give yourself completely to God. Give yourself completely to God. That phrase alone is worth a month of sermons. But let me just point out two things that this includes from us. And it will be painfully obvious, but challenging to live out. How many of you have known some painfully obvious things that become very hard to live out? We need, this includes you giving yourself. That's painfully obvious in that scripture. He says, give yourselves completely to God. How many of you would just rather give somebody else? We take up an offering today, we can vote somebody off the island, right? Hey, who should we give to God today? That's way easier. How many of us would say, well, send me. T- take my life. Don't let everybody stay, just take my life. Paul says, if you're going to do anything, you need to start by giving yourself completely to God. 
Did you know that giving yourself is the hardest thing to do? But that's exactly what God wants you to give. He wants you to give yourself. As Christians, we are giving people, are we not? We give over and over again. We give of our time. We give of our money. We give to serve Christ. We give to serve others. But did you know that you can do all of that without giving yourself? You can give your time. You can give your money. You can give some of your talents or gifts or whatever. But that doesn't equal giving you. Our money and our time, they're just extensions of who we are. But they're not us. God says, I want you. I want you to give yourself to me. Not, not, not anything else. I want you to give me yourself. So Paul says, you must give yourself completely to God. Let me just make a, uh, a distinction here. This is different than being saved from your sins. Did you know that? Because some of us will say, well, I'm saved. I, I got saved. No, that's great. That's good. That's a good first step. That's the seed being planted in the ground and a little sprout coming up. Now God says, I need you to give me all of yourself. If you want to hit 10 foot tall, you got to give me all. you got to give me all of it if you want all the growth that I have for you. So giving yourself completely to God can happen at the time of salvation for some of us. If you go all in, and I've seen it happen, you see people radically saved, and they go in all in for God all the time. However, the majority of us usually come to Christ and we get saved. We just know that we're sinners. We need our, life, we need something for, we need our sins forgiven. And we are so thankful just to have that that we don't even realize that there's more than that until we get a couple miles down the road and we begin to try to live out our faith and we realize, wait a minute, he's still talking to me about stuff. He's still talking to me about my time. He's still talking to me about my money. He's still talking about the way I talk. He's still talking to me about the way I walk. He's still talking to me, all that stuff. And so he's going to start asking you, for, will you surrender this? Will you surrender this? Will you surrender this? Will you surrender this? He wants all of you. He says, give yourself completely. So we need to understand that this is beyond salvation. Salvation is a, needs to happen before that or it can happen at the same time for some of us, but it needs to happen. When we come to the point, uh, we need to come to the point where we realize that we are forgiven but there's more than that that God has for us. Aren't you thankful for that? I am. I'm thankful that I don't just get new shoes and then I get to stand around. Like, that, that's like getting saved, right? If you just get saved, that is amazing. It's a wonderful gift, but that just starts you on your journey for Christ. When I bought my new boots and put them on, I was like, yeah! That's it, that's it. I'll just stand here. And he's like, no, no, take those boots. Go out, get to walking. Get enjoying. Go out into the world. I have so much more for you to see and do. That's how our salvation is. We are saved. You got your boots on. You got to get it out. And as we get down the road, we realize, you know what? I can't deal with this person without more of God in my life. I can't love my spouse without more God in my life. I can't love my kids. I can't raise my kids without God's help. My salvation is great, and my sins are forgiven. But guess what? I'm a bigger mess than that. I need more help. And God says, give me all you. Give me yourself completely, and I'll help with your spouse. I'll help with your kids. I'll help with your job. I'll help with your school. But you've got to give me all yourself. Paul says, give yourself completely to God. He wants us to do that. And Paul says that we can have new lives, or we, since we have new lives, give yourselves completely to God. God doesn't want your stuff. You need to hear that. God doesn't want your stuff. He owns everything. What you have is just on loan. I've heard people say, well, the church just wants my money. God just wants my money. Oh, he just wants my time. He just wants my house. He don't want none of that. He wants you. Do you know what he does, though? He'll ask you to continue to surrender one thing at a time that gets in the way of his blessings in your life. And he'll continue to do that until you say, I'm tired, Lord. I'm tired of dealing with all this. Just take it all. You can have it all and have me too. I'm sick of dying a thousand deaths once at a time. But guess what? He'll do that over and over and over for us until we just say, you know what, Lord? I want to be completely yours. I don't want to have to keep parceling out, parceling out, parceling out. I'll tell you what, I've walked that journey out. It started for me in just a brief, started for me with basketball. Basketball was a demigod to me at one time. 
And, and if you don't know what that means, that means that I was still a believer and still believed in Jesus, but I loved basketball, playing basketball. God said, I want you to give me the basketball. And I said, at, at an altar in West Virginia, I said, all right, God, you can have basketball. You can have that and you can have everything else. I walked a little further down the road and the Lord said, I, I want you to give me your music choices. Will, will you surrender the music that you listen to for me? Okay, God, I'll give you that. Walk a little further down the road. He asked me for other things, movies that I watch, different things. Then at one point, you just get to the point where you're like, God, I get it. All this stuff, I haven't surrendered it to you. But I want to give it all to you, and I want to give myself to you. Because he's only knocking off those things until, guess who's standing? Just you. And he says, that's what I've been trying to get all along. I don't want your house. I don't want your money. I don't want any of that stuff. I'm just trying to peel that back so you just get to you when you're like, well, it's only me left. So guess what you can do? You can shorten that time by just saying, God, I give myself completely to you. Or you can take the longer road. And he'll let you have that choice, and that is our choice to do that. He'll do that until we're willing to give ourselves to him completely. So that's the second thing that's painfully obvious in this passage We can't just give ourselves. We have to give ourselves completely because that's what he wants from each and every one of us. Look again at what how Paul defines completely. He says this, so use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Use your whole body. And you know what we think of as as humans? Hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, whatever. What, what's Paul really saying? All of you. You've got to give your whole self, not just your body parts. Are your body parts included? Yes. But he's not collecting body parts. God wants all of us, our personality, our lives, every part of us. Paul says you have to give that to him completely. We need to give ourselves completely to him to do what is right for the glory of God. So let me just give you this opportunity in just a few moments. When we end the service today and you have an opportunity to respond, if you haven't given God everything but you want to and you say, Lord, I've been parceling out my life or maybe I'm saved and I've never done anything else, let me just encourage you to pray at the end of the service and tell the Lord, Lord, I want to give myself completely to you today to do what is right for the glory of God. I want to do that. I want to live this new life to the fullest extent. If you're not ready for that step yet, you need to know that that's the step the Lord is getting you ready for. That is the path that you are on as a believer in Jesus Christ. That is the path that we are all heading towards one way or another. So you'll get the chance to to take that step as well. But maybe for you, the prayer today is just this. Help me to learn what it means to give myself completely to you. Maybe you have something so glaringly big in the way, like I did with basketball, that he's going to have to say, you know what, we're going to have to get the basketball out of the way before we can even talk about you giving yourself, because you're so distracted by that that you can't even hear what I'm telling you otherwise. So maybe for you today, that's fine. That's just part of your journey. And how how many of you are just thankful that we have grace for the journey? I I am. (laughs) I'm exceedingly thankful. If, I, if you knew all the pit stops I took along the way to surrendering completely to God, we'd be here for hours telling stories. But guess what? God graciously walks us down that path and says, look, so maybe today you're like, man, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to give myself completely. And you just say, God, I'm not ready, but would you help me to learn what it's like to give myself completely to you? And he will graciously help you with that. He will graciously walk you down that road. We have to do that before we can continue out into the world to do what he really has planned for us to do. Because if not, we're going to go out completely mistaken for what we're doing out there. And that happens all the time. You ever gone out and gone out somewhere and figured out, forgot what you were doing out there? Well, what am I out here for? What did I come in this room for? I can't remember. God doesn't want us to go out into the world representing him and not know what we're doing out there. He wants us to be completely, fully surrendered to him so we know what we are doing for him. After we've prayed that prayer, and after we've completely given ourselves to God, then we can begin each day doing that same thing as we head out into the world. We can daily pray, God, I give you myself today. 
Help me to go out and represent you well. Give me the words to say and the places to go that I could be effective for you today. We can pray that once, yes, as a life statement, but then guess what? We start each new day saying that. It gives us a new perspective on life. I'm not just going through life, just doing whatever I want. I'm doing life intentionally with God's presence, knowing that he has gifted me this day to do something for him, to do something good for him. And that's an amazing thing that we get a chance to live out in the real world. So we can pray that every day. And that changes how we view and respond to the things that come along in our lives. And it changes how we can begin to enact our new life. Because we no longer respond as we naturally would before the new life came, when we realize that we're going out as representatives of Christ. Do you know there, there's times in my life that, that, that the old Michael wants to speak out against stuff that I see or things that I experience, and I think, oh, nope, that's the old Michael. That's, that's the one I took off and is dead. I have new life within me. I need to speak grace. I need to speak love. I need to speak truth. I need to speak what Christ would say in this situation. And that's not just for pastors. That's for all believers. I just happen to be a pastor. But that's for all of us. We have to go out and respond the way that Christ would in each situation that we find ourselves in. And he will help us to do that. Let's look at another scripture to help us answer that question about what are we to do as we're going out. Because completely surrendering ourselves is only the first step. And it's only the path to get us to where we're going. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says this. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. God created you in your mother's womb. How many of you believe that? How many of you are still working on believing that one? It's okay. Some of us are still working on that. God created us in our mother's womb to have life. He gave you your hair color or lack of thereof or whatever. He gave us all of our physical abilities. He gives us the gift of life. And then he creates us again. He creates us anew, the scripture says, in Christ. And guess what he calls us? His masterpiece. When he created us the first time, or you read the Genesis account, he called us what? Good, or very good, right? After he makes us anew in Christ, what does he call you? It's right there on the screen. His masterpiece. How many of you are just glad to be good? How many of you are like, hey, hey, if there's another level, I like that. I want to be a masterpiece. How many of you want to be a masterpiece? He says he's already created that in you. It, 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 he's given you life. And that's amazing. And he calls it good. But he says, man, if you want to, the masterpiece, I need to recreate you anew in Christ. And when we've given our lives to him, when we've experienced salvation, when we've given ourselves completely to him, we begin to become that masterpiece. And he creates us anew in Christ to be what we were always intended to be. And it's an amazing thing to see and to experience. And we have the privilege of doing that, each one of us, personally. So God created us and then recreated us uh, because he, gave, he has specific good things planned for you to do. He has created you and recreated you because he has specific good things planned for you to do for him. How many of you, just that just blows your mind that God would pay that much attention to you? That he would not only create you the first time, some of us are just getting used to that, that I was actually created by God to look like this, to act like this, to talk like this, to live in this place. But then there's a whole other new creation. You've been created anew. You've been created anew to go and do good things for my glory, for my, not me, him, for his glory, for his good. And he had planned that for you long ago. How amazing is that? That is way, way amazing. God um, has done these things for us. They are good things as we head out into the world to do because we do them as representative, representatives of Christ. Remember, we said that's why we're going out into the world. He sends us out as his representatives as his ambassadors we're to go out and represent christ in the way that we live here's the sad thing 
Too many Christians are going out into the world and living however they want and using their time and energy to do what they want to do. But what did that scripture tell us? God gave us new life to do the good things we had planned or he had planned. Oh, whoops. That changes our calendar a little bit, doesn't it? Wait, what about all the good things I had planned? Sorry, if you're all in, you surrendered that. You surrendered that to him. And he says, I have good things planned for you to go and do for me, not for you. Too many of us Christians are out doing what we want to do in the name of Jesus Christ. Or maybe not even in his name. We're just wandering around the world doing whatever we want. He says, that's not what new life was for. New life is not for to go out and live and entertain yourself. The new life is to go out and do the good things I've created you to do. I created you anew. If you ever want to thrive out there, if you ever want to just you know, feel like you really fit out there, and you're not just surviving this world, but you're thriving and you're accomplishing what I've called you to do, you have to do the plan and the good things I've called and renewed you, remade you to do. And that is an amazing gift he gives us, but that's something that we are missing out on if we have not completely surrendered to him and if we have not uh, asked him what he created us to do. So that's the second thing that we need to be doing. Since God created us anew in Christ and we have been sent out into the world, we need to ask God what he created us to do for him. How many of you know, how many, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. How many of you think that's the most scary statement you've heard so far? And We've had a few scary statements in this sermon already. How many of you are like, I'd be willing to ask God what he recreated me for? How many of you are like, there is no chance in the world I'm asking God because I'm going to Africa, right? How many of us think that? Don't raise, you know, I used to get down to raise your hand. Lots of us think those things. I'm not asking God that question because he might ask me to do something I don't want to do. Well, guess whose agenda is still on the throne in your heart then? Yours. When you completely give yourself to God and you say, God, you can have it all. And he says, I need you to go to Connellsville. Will you go? Okay. I need you to go to Wilmore, Kentucky. Will you go there? Okay. Will you go to Coquille, Oregon? Okay, I'll go there. I don't know where any of those places are at, but okay, whatever. As long as you're leading, I'm following. We do not have to fear where he will lead us. It's not always to Africa. It's not always even out of your neighborhood. But we need to be completely surrendered to his will, and we need to say, God, you're the one that created me in the first place. And then by your amazing love and grace, you recreated me in Christ to make me a masterpiece. Show me where I need to go to do life as a representative of you. For some, it could be Africa. It could be Papua New Guinea. It could be wherever. But guess what will happen when you get there? It'll be the most amazing place you've ever been. And you think, man, I was made to live here. I cannot believe how happy I am to be here. You've heard the Porter stories as well. We think, well, how, how could I be happy there? Well, God didn't call you there. But if God called you there and he places you there, it's going to be the happiest place on earth, and it ain't Disneyland. The happiest place on earth is to be on point in God's will, doing what he called you to do, where he called you to do it, no matter what the surroundings look like. We have loved every place that we've lived in for the period that God has placed us there. And that is an amazing thing. People always say, well, how could you do the hot? How could you do the cold? How could you do whatever? We just say, we just live life. We just live life for God. That's it. There's bonuses, there's negatives at times, but, but guess what? It doesn't matter because we're not here for the weather. We're here for God. What are you here for? Let me challenge you to ask the Lord, Lord, what did you recreate me for? What did you put me, what did you uh, put that new life in me to accomplish? We can ask him for that. And we can ask him for the overall direction for our life, but also the daily directions that we need. How many of you don't just need one life direction? You need like 10 life reminders. Okay. He will do that over and over and over again for us. I'll give you just a brief uh, account of how this happened in my own life. Um, he, he gave me 
uh, I can't even remember how old I was, but Trevor was only about four months old, when he gave me my call to ministry. He said, you need to go back to school to become a minister, okay? I was a mechanic before, if you, weren't, if you don't follow along every week. Okay, well, that's a huge life change. So then we had to ask the next question. How many know when God tells you one thing, and it, it's something that we laugh, that it brings up more questions than the one he just answered? So when you ask the Lord, what should I do with my life? And he's like, oh, you should go back to school and be a minister. Like, oh, good. Where should I go to school? How should I get there? How should I pay for it? All those questions come. Then halfway through my Bible training, he said, you need to preach. See, I didn't think I was going to be a preacher. I didn't even want to be a preacher. But he said, that's what I've gifted you new life to do. And if you want to do this for me, you're going to have to do what I ask you to do. That's why I'm standing here today. The story goes on, but guess what? Over time, the Lord unfolds more and more of what he created you to do. So we can ask for his direction for our overall direction in life. But then we can ask for every step along the way. Okay, Lord, show us what school to go to. Okay, Lord, show us which church to work at. Okay, God, show us the next thing and the next thing. And he'll do the same for you because he's creating you to be a masterpiece for him. But you have to ask him, God, what did you create me to do? Once we finally understand the specific things, the specific good things that he created for us, it gives our lives great value and purpose. So many people walk through this world and they'll end their life never fulfilling, feeling fulfilled in their value or purpose in life. And you know why that is? It's because they never completely surrendered to God. And they never asked him, God, what did you put me here for? You'll never find value, lasting value. And you'll never find purpose until you find it from him. But guess what? We can all find it in him. Because it's part of our new life that he is creating the masterpiece of our lives to be. Our value and purpose come not from, not from what we are doing, but for why and for whom we are doing it. You see, it doesn't matter whether I'm a mechanic or whether I'm a pastor or whether you're a school teacher or a stay-at-home parent. It doesn't matter if you work in the medical field or the school field or, or wherever, if you're a factory worker. It, the, 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 the a value and the purpose doesn't come from the assigned task. You can have just as much fun as I'm having because of who called us to do it. And we do it because the Lord asked us to. That's where the purpose and the value come from because I'm serving his purposes, not mine. And we do it for not our own glory, but for his. And that gives us great value and purpose knowing I'm fulfilling kingdom work. I'm fulfilling the work that God has assigned me to do. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's in the hospital. Maybe it's wherever. It doesn't have to be in the church. It doesn't have to be on the mission field. It does have to be directed by God and done for God's glory, no matter where you work or what you do. But guess what? There is great value and great purpose to be found when you ask the Lord, what did you create me for? Because I so want to complete that with my life to bring you glory. And he will tell us, I got to press on. So let's look at one more scripture here that helps us answer this question as we go out to do, um, to find out what we're to be doing as we go out. First Peter 2, 9 says this, as soon as I get there, says this, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession as a result of you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into the, wonderful, or into the wonderful light. The third thing that we need to do as we go out into the world is this, also painfully obvious. We are to show others the goodness of God. You are to go and show God's goodness in whatever he calls you to do, whatever that means for you. You need to say, I'm here to show the goodness of God because he's already shown it to me and he continues to pour it out in and through my lives. As we go out into the world, we need to do good things that he has prepared for us to do. And as we do them, we are showing them the goodness of God through our attitudes and through our actions. That's a huge challenge, isn't it? And we'll never pull that off if we're not fully surrendered because guess what? Our old nature will bust through and say, this is, Who's responding? 
Are you showing God? Are you showing God's goodness, or are you showing your nature towards other people? You need to hear this this morning. God doesn't need us to show people His anger. He will take care of that later. God doesn't need us to show people His judgment against them. Jesus will take care of that too. We're in a continuing ramped up, heated society for all different things and there's anger and judgment being thrown around everywhere it's election week it only gets worse but it only magnifies what's already there jesus doesn't need you to proclaim any of that in his name that is not your task your task is to go and show the goodness of god through your words and through your actions even in a difficult setting what god needs us to do is to show the world his goodness right where he has planted us, right where he has called us to be. And he has, and he will continue to show you his goodness so you can go out and proclaim it to others, so you can go out and live that out for others. So um, we just need to continue to live and tell others the goodness that he continues to show to us. And we can show his goodness in a wide variety of ways and in a wide variety of settings. There is no limit to the places where we can go and show the goodness of God. That's why there's so many of us called to do this. Because I can't be everywhere. Buck can't be everywhere. Wendy can't be everywhere. But guess what? Every completely surrendered child of God can be everywhere that God needs them to be. To show his goodness in all the places that they are. But we have to realize why we're there. And we have to realize that it's not about my agenda. It's about who he is and bringing him glory. Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says this. <clears throat> also to help us as we're heading out, says this. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so you will have the right response for everyone. My friends, we can ask God, how can I show your goodness in this setting and in this situation? And maybe we just need to pause before a lot of different meetings or a lot of different situations and say, God, I'm heading in this and I'm feeling the old man coming back up. And God, I, I don't want that. I want your new life to be displayed for me. How can I go into this situation or in the midst of the situation, you can just say, God, will you give me the right words to show your goodness to these people? Help my conversations to be gracious and unattractive. How many of you, if somebody heard your conversations, they would say, yeah, that's what your conversations are all about. Or they'd be like, um, yeah, I heard a couple of those conversations. They're not attractive or gracious. He says, let your conversations be gracious and attractive. How many of you would love to have the right response to every person every time? I pray that often. That's on my own personal prayer list. Because I get lots of calls, lots of situations, whatever. And I've learned to pray, Lord, this is an honest to goodness, it's not really confession, just truth. Sometimes I used to pray, Lord, just give me the message on Sunday. And then guess what? As I've grown in my faith with the Lord, guess what? Sunday ain't enough. I know there's more. So now I have to switch to that passage where I say, Lord, I, I need your word not just on Sunday. I need your word for people every day and in every moment. And it helps me to be rem remain dependent on him, to speak his words everywhere I go. Is that easy? No. Is he faithful to do that? Yes. Oh, yes. Unbelievably, yes. And it's not just for pastors. This is for everybody. Let your words be gracious and attractive. And then you'll have, it doesn't say you might get, it says then you'll have the right response to every situation. What? You can't get better than that. That's amazing, my friends. That's part of our new life that he wants us to experience. And he's got us on that journey of growing and, and getting there. And we need to do our part and we need to be prepared as we head out into the world. So as we head out again in just a few moments, let me ask you this. As you go out, what are you going to go out and do? You have a chance to leave here again today. Are you going to go out completely surrendered to God and say, God, I want to give myself completely to you. I realize now that that's what you're trying to peel all these things out of my life. 
until I just say, God, you can have it all? Are you going to ask maybe, God, what did you really create me for? What did you recreate me for in Christ? What is it that you have for me to do? And maybe you need to just start by surrendering and saying, God, I, I just surrender the fear because I'm, I'm afraid of what you're going to say. But guess what he says? I've created you for good things. Not, not bad things. Not to punish you. Not to do good things. But it only comes when you're completely surrendered. So maybe you just this morning say, God, I just want to ask. Would you show me what it is you've recreated me to do for you? And then maybe some of us just need to say, God, would you help me to show the goodness of you to those around me? Not just once, not just on Sundays, but in every situation. Would you help me to show your goodness to those that you bring across my path? As we close the day, let me just ask you to just pray your response to the Lord, and then we'll close in prayer together. Heavenly Father, you have so much new life for us to experience, but it has to come the way that you have designed it to come. And it has to begin by not just salvation, which is amazing, but Lord, it has to come with complete surrender of ourselves to you. So Lord, some of us are in that place today, and we're ready to surrender. We're ready to say, Lord, I realize that there's more to this life than just salvation, and that my journey has much more growth, and, and I don't want to have to peel off one thing at a time. I, I want to just go all in. So Lord, just hear the, the, the prayers of those hearts today who are saying, Lord, just take it all. Just take me and take everything. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are asking the next step. Lord, show me what to do with this new life. You have gifted it to me for good, uh, for, for doing good things for your glory. So, Lord, as we seek that from you today, Lord, would you point that out to us? Lord, help us to, to hear from you, whether it be instantaneous or, or through a, a process of revelation. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to each who is asking what specifically you have created them for, that they might find their value and their purpose in serving you. And Lord, as we progress on, Lord, we pray that you would help us to show your goodness everywhere we go and in every situation. And Father, that is only possible with your amazing help and love poured through us every second of every day. But Father, that's what the new life is. It's for every moment of every life situation so, Lord, there are many of us heading into some challenging situations this week. Some are great, some are challenging, some are difficult, some are grieving, some are sorrow. Lord, would you give us just your words and your goodness to share with those around us that you would be glorified and others might see that this new life really does work in this world. And we can walk with great confidence in Christ, not because of who we are, but because of who you are in us. Lord, may we live masterpiece lives for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in the love of the Father, who has not only created you, but recreated you anew. Go in the, the power of Jesus Christ that give you the words and the presence that you need in your situation this week. And may the Holy Spirit give you the courage to live it out. For God's glory, you are dismissed. <clears throat>